Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Jay Keck, and I work for the South Carolina Wildlife Federation, and I'm joined by Isaiah Irby. He's a professional photographer. We have Justin Johnson, uh, Saluda Shoals uh, Ranger, and then we have Jennifer or Jen Tyrell with South Carolina Audubon. Um, and what are we doing here today? We are talking about birds. Um, specifically during the time of, of Black Birders Week, which is coming up pretty soon. Um, and just want to encourage, um, you know, our African-American friends here in South Carolina and wherever else they may, might be watching this from, uh, to get out and explore. Um, you know, every, just imagine all races of the world getting into birds um, and then becoming lovers of, of nature and then becoming stewards of, of the environment. So um, it's, it's free and available to everybody and we just encourage everybody to, to get out there and, uh, and do it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to start off with, with a question, uh, what is birding and, and who does it? And Isaiah, if, if you don't mind, you wanna go ahead and tackle that question first? Yes, sir. <laughs> So to me, uh, birding isn't just the fact about, you know, finding unique birds or birds that are, you know, in the state of South Carolina, but birding is just an opportunity to get out the outdoors to kind of enjoy what it has to offer. You know, if you ask me, I feel like the birds itself kind of is a plus to getting outside, being out, you know, with people that you love and just being around nature. Uh, when you ask the question of who does it, I feel like any and everyone can do it. Uh, and I really feel like any and everyone can do it because the ability of seeing new things, getting around new people and experiencing new experiences. So I feel like anyone can enjoy birding and enjoy, you know, the experience from birding. Amen to that. What about you, Justin? Um, so for me, uh, birding is a hiking multiplier. It's a hiking experience multiplier. Uh, when you go out on the trails, oftentimes you find yourself trying to find snakes or bears or um, hogs or what have you. But when you go out on the trail, you find out that a lot of times it's not a lot to see. So as time went on, uh, I began to realize that while I might see 20 snakes uh, over 100 hikes, I'll see 20 birds on one hike. Um, and so from there, you get to you know, do what I call the world's greatest scavenger hunt. You're trying to maybe identify the sounds or you might be following the same bird hoping it'll sit still long enough uh, for you to get a good glimpse at it. And it, it makes your, your hiking experience and your outdoor experience um, a lot more fun. Who does it? Uh, definitely everyone. Anyone who has the ability to just go outside, even if you're watching from the kitchen table at your bird feeder, uh, some, of the best bird fe some of the best birding is done at people's, you know, bird feeder in various people's backyard. But just to be able to get outside and, um, and explore and appreciate the beautiful colors and the sounds that you see around you. Um, I think anyone is capable of doing it and it doesn't take a very long time to learn your birds. Awesome. And Jennifer? Well, I think birding to me is a technical term. When I say birding, that means I am specifically going outside with the intent of seeing birds and looking for birds. However, um, I think birding can mean almost anything because like you guys mentioned before, you know, their birds are everywhere and you can, you know, see them almost any time of day, no matter where you are, you know, sitting at my kitchen table. Um, sometimes I'm birding just like sitting at my desk doing work. I can hear the birds outside and I'm mentally making lists of what I'm hearing and what's in the yard. And um, I, I say I have something called IIDD, involuntary ID disorder, because uh, no matter where I am, I'm just identifying birds to the people around me, whether they asked or not. So, you know, you can really be birding anytime, anywhere, and, you know, anyone can do it. So whoever's with me uh, just ends up birding because I'm always pointing them out and talking about them. So yes, anybody can bird if you're looking at birds and enjoying them. Uh, whether in a very specific driven role when you're out on a bird walk or just out and about every day, you know, looking at the birds in the parking lot at the grocery store. You know, I think birding is for anyone, anywhere, anytime. Um, that kind of reminds me of, of one time in, in our church parking lot. There were, I had just met my wife's counterpart and, and his wife. And uh, we were just sitting there or standing there and uh, all of a sudden a red shoulder hawk just started going off. And the IIDD, I think is what you called it, that started going off. Natalie, my wife, just started shaking her head like, nope, we don't need to know. They don't need to know. It's OK. Just keep that to yourself right now. <laughs> um, 
You know, but for birding for me, you know, whenever I think about uh, just having gotten into, you know, whatever you want to call this, a sport or a love or a hobby, um, gosh, it was just pure excitement um, and adrenaline. And I just wanted to find these gorgeous animals that I knew nothing about. I didn't know existed. So it was a scavenger hunt. It was... Um, it was, it was just amazing. Um, and my mind would just get blown by the pure beauty of these birds. I'm a, I'm a big songbird guy. So just finding these little, little ornaments, little treasures in the trees was just an adventure to me. Um, you know, and, and being an adult, you know, in my thirties, early thirties, getting into it made me feel like a kid again. And that was pretty darn cool. So it gave me that excitement, um, that life that, that a kid has. And, and, uh, um, it, that was really neat. And I still have that. Um, although now I just, it just connects me to the planet in ways that I, uh, I never knew, you know, was, was possible. Um, and I grew up hunting and, and fishing and I was, I thought I was connected, but boy, birds, <laughs> birds and, and pollinators and snakes, they, they can really tell a, a different story and a deeper story than, than, uh, you know, just, just getting out there and, and hunting. But, um, you know, one of my heroes, Drew Lanham pictured here, uh, he's a professor. He's a he's a birder. He's a golfer. Um, I golf. Um, he's an author, and and he's also a hunter. So you know anybody can do it. Uh, Isaiah, don't aren't you a boxer or something as well? Yes, sir. I do Muay Thai. Yeah, Muay Thai. Uh, <laughs> uh, very. It sounds like a very fancy form of uh, of boxing. <laughs> but but anyhow, you know anybody can do this. I know there's a fellow by the name of Pat McNamara who is a retired special forces um, operator, and he's into birding. So um, you know, don't discount yourself. Get out there and and give it a try. All right. So back to Isaiah. Um, tell your story. How did you get into birding? So me personally getting into birding really, you know, it came over a time period uh, because with me, I was more interested in just any and every animal known to man, you know. So me actually getting into birding, I actually had the opportunity uh, that Jay was actually doing a bird walk at the uh, Riverbank Zoo in Columbia. Uh, and when that time happened, you know, me and my fiance Jasmine, which is a bird or two, <laughs> she also, we, we went down to uh, do a bird walk with Jay. You know, we learned so much, we opened our eyes to so many different things other than, you know, a lot of the animals that we're used to seeing in the zoos. Uh, kind of playing off of what Justin said, you know, a lot of people are looking for the snakes, the bears, the tigers, you know, the, the big, the big and, you know, um, amusing animals, but when it comes to birding, it's just something that you, you know, you can do at any time, like a day, you know, which is a cool thing about birds is that, you know, just doing it in a simple walk. So me personally, I got into it, you know, when Jay actually opened my eyes, teaching me a lot about birds, showing me more, more ways to find them, more ways to, you know, bring them to your household, just different things like that. So that's how I actually got into it. If you, you're not asking, like, when it comes to how far I've started to go, I don't think I'm going to stop now. <laughs> uh, because when it, my experiences have grown through time, and I say that again because when I first started birding, I was used to seeing, you know, normal birds that I consider them because they're not migratory birds. Uh, so when I started really just learning about migratory birds from Jay, uh, redoing my own research, doing my own little walks, uh, you know, of course, attending a lot of walks with Jay, it kind of really opened my eyes. So that's how I personally got into it was because I've already always have a love for animals. But birding came from, you know, going on my first bird walk. And my first bird walk is actually what kind of made me intrigued about all these different types and forms of birds. That's awesome. Well, now you're kind of paying it forward, aren't you? You're, you're teaching kids in your, in your area about, about not just birds, but about nature, aren't, aren't you? Yeah, now I am. I'm starting to get into more of it. Because uh, like Jay was telling you guys, I do a lot when it comes to, you know, outdoors adventures. But I also have a lot of animals that I use as animal ambassadors. And, you, and I'm starting a breeding program uh, to, you know, help with conservation and, and, you know, keeping up numbers. So that is where I am now. So a lot of times now we're, we're attempting to get into more schools you know, taking our animals down, showing them, teaching them about directly uh, South Carolina animals. Uh, because I feel like it's good to learn about international animals because we do need to know about them and they actually do play a big role. But for those that are in South Carolina, 
you know, I feel like this is going to be a, even, you know, more of an impact because these are animals that people are actually going to see and encounter, uh, you know, on walks in your backyard, you know, just, you, you can, like, like Jay was saying, you know, you can be at church and just look around and mm-hmm. the bird just flies right around. But for some people, they just don't know what that is. You know, going back to the ID thing, uh, Jennifer, <laughs> they don't know, but, you know, us giving them the opportunity to kind of just see them, you know, in person kind of gives them a way bigger understanding when they see them in the wild. Yeah. And uh, no, well, well said, man. Um, and I, and I love that uh, your first birding experience was at the zoo. That was a, that was a great day and it was awesome meeting y'all there. But, uh, you know, and, and so his, his world's been um, opened up to him. And, and I think you told me that your favorite bird, at least here in South Carolina, is this gorgeous painted, painted bunning. Uh, and then, you know, you've, you've taken some beautiful pictures of, of birds as well. And then you get a little bit dirty. You know, you sent me that picture uh, just recently. And I was like, oh, check it out. Now, I have looked at birds, and all of y'all probably have, with binocul- binoculars laying down on your back like that. So I get that. I started <laughs> laughing whenever I saw that. But uh, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do to get the good bird shot. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's, uh, let's go on to Justin. Uh, where, where'd that love start? So for me, uh, my first experience with birds was when I lived in Myrtle Beach. Well, we had a condo in Myrtle Beach and we visited a lot. Um, And as a little kid, I remember chasing the gulls up and down the beach in the sand and trying to throw them in the air so the the gulls would hover and they'd catch the bread out of the air. And then I saw these two birds, they were on the beach and they were talking back and forth, but in a laughing fashion. Um, And they were laughing gulls, one of my favorite birds. And my mom, she proceeded to take me to the toy store and she bought me a toy and I squeezed it. And every time I squeeze it, it didn't sound like a laughing goal. It sounded more like a rubber duck. But um, <laughs> this was uh, the, the bath duck. But it, it, it uh, was my first real experience with um, enjoying birds and being interested in birds. Uh, she eventually, two or three days later, she took that toy away from me because I, I played with it a little too much. <laughs> but um, that was my first start. So generally, I, I do appreciate goals. From there, um, I actually have a picture of astronomy here in the bottom. I'm doing astronomy at the Congaree. And I did that on purpose because science can be daunting or scary. But we have, as scientists or people interested in just the outdoors or being in nature in general, science can be a little scary or daunting if you're trying to understand it at a, maybe even a deeper level. But what happens is it's, if you can grab onto something like astronomy or you can grab onto something like birding, no matter how daunting or scary some of those science classes might be, you can always think back to, oh man, physics is challenging. But I know that if I understand physics, I can understand how a, a bird's wings works or I can later apply that to maybe a new type of aircraft. So you can grab onto these different things and it grows your passion. Uh, I took a ornithology class in college And that's kind of where it began to take off. I bought a camera and you have two options. You know, you you can sit there and you can draw your your birds out and you're right in the rain um, and get the wing bands and the colors, uh, the beak shape. But once you get a camera um, and any camera really do, often phone cameras have little attachments that you can get um, decent photos of. But I began to take photos. I began to learn how to identify birds and their sounds. Um, and then the biggest thing for me was eBird. eBird was, it's like, a, I kind of like the competition of it. In Horry County, if you go by county, you can place pretty high starting in January. And I kept up with it and kept up with it and kept up with it. And I was a few birds behind my science professor for the longest time. But right when we got around 80 species, he, he took off on me. <laughs> and that's when it got down to the really unique birds that were very hard to find. It'd be like at a random random person's uh, backyard in the middle of the country. Um, so that's kind of how it really, really took off for me. And, uh, and that's, and today I still do birding. We, we go out with different groups here at Saluda Shoals Park. And it's just extremely exciting to go out, find a new bird that you've never seen before. And even the males and females are different. So you can go a long time, like see, you might see a many Northern Cardinals um, that are red. And then finally, you finally see a brown one that's a female. So even that 
that those differences between male and female add another aspect of the different beautiful colors behind birds. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I'm glad that you mentioned eBird because it is it is such a great resource. But um, so he's talking about a website www.ebird.org, and you can you can explore any part of South Carolina, almost any part of the world, and see what kind of birds are being seen. And then you get to record. You sign up, and you, it's free. You get to record, you know, whatever you're seeing. So it's a great way to become a better birder. It's a great way to learn about the birds in the area in which you live, or in any area that you're exploring. Um, but no, I, I had a diff different perspective on the, the night sky um, picture that you sent. Uh, for me, and I, and I love what you said, but for me, I was like, man, this is really cool because it has nothing really to do about birds. I mean, you're seeing bird habitat, but, um, but it, it speaks to how birding can just open up your eyes to the entire planet. You know, when, when I lead bird walks, you know, we're looking at rocks, you know, for 30 minutes sometimes. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for caterpillars, we're looking for snakes, we're looking for everything that's that's on this planet. And it's just such a cool uh, thing that, that birding does. It just, uh, man, it just opens up earth to you. And I think that's pretty darn pretty darn cool. And I just loved how you're, you're out there exploring the night sky. And you can see that you go out on an owl prowl. We were out on an owl prowl and we saw the space station fly over us. I mean, how, how cool is that? And then all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, plant, you're thinking about planets, you're thinking about galaxies. Um, so just, and that, that's just the power of birding, I think. Um, thank you, Justin. All right, Jen, talk to, talk to us about Mary Poppins. <laughs> So I have two very early memories of birds when I was a real little kid. And one of them was, I used to watch uh, this taped version of Mary Poppins. My mom recorded it off TV uh, one day and I watched it all the time. And my favorite part was when Mary Poppins was singing her little song about like cleaning up the room or something. And she would lean out the window and whistle and this little robin came over and landed on her hand and sang with her and then it flew off. And I just thought, I want a bird to land on me so badly. That would be the coolest thing. And so when I was little, I used to walk around in the woods in my backyard whistling like this, thinking a bird is going to land on me. Um, and it's funny because, uh, you know, as my interest grew, I got more and more into it. But as my first professional job, I was training raptors. And so that's literally what I did all day. It was just having birds land on my hand. And it was as cool and cooler than I imagined as a kid. It was just so, so neat. Um, and so, you know, that love of birds that started really early for me has turned into a, a full-time career. And I guess as far as birding goes, I remember the first time someone identified a bird to me and it was my dad and I was real little. I remember walking down the street with him holding his hand and he looked up in a tree and there was this little bird that was really close to us and it was super cute. And then he goes, oh, I think that's a chickadee. And for some reason that just like blew my mind that he knew what it was. Um, and so from then on, you know, I just loved birds and nature. And my very first job in like high school was working at a Wild Birds Unlimited, where then I learned about, you know, our backyard birds and how to feed them and how to identify them for people. And so it just, it just went from there and it went nuts. Um, and now it's like, it's all I do is talk about birds and nature. And, um, you know, like you said, Jay, I, uh, I now notice a lot more about our natural world. I've found that being a birder and really being out there and just looking and listening, it's really tuned my senses to the world around me. Like now that I go out and go birding, I'm also noticing like a, an anole 30 feet up in a tree, you know, a little lizard hopping back and forth because I'm just really tuned into movement and that I'm noticing the plants on the ground. And then I learned about how much uh, native plants are really, really important for birds and habitat. And so now I'm like a plant fanatic. And so, you know, some women like to buy purses and shoes, but I have a plant problem. I just keep coming home with more and more native plants and I just am building this whole backyard habitat. And so it's just, it's fun to see how it's just escalated. And now I love to identify butterflies and we're raising caterpillars from the yard. Um, so yeah, it just really brings you into the whole natural world. So not just birds, but everything. So that's kind of how my addiction started. 
I think that's awesome. And, you know, for whoever's watching this, y'all know this is real. It's not just me that's whose life, you know, life was changed by this. I mean, you know, the, the birds ex uh, opened our eyes to to everything, all four of us. And and we're just kind of scratching the surface of how many how many people have been uh, affected you know, <laughs> by birds. Affected and I guess infected, maybe. <laughs> um, but so, so my story is just simple. I, I saw a pretty bird, you know, about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, and I was, I used to settle injury claims with an insurance company um, <clears throat> and sold some insurance. And this bird flew in front of me and it was absolutely stunning. Um, and the bird is a Baltimore Oriole pictured right there. Um, and then about two weeks later um, on, while I was working, I pulled over because I saw a beautiful bird um, on the side of the road and it, it's called an indigo bunting. And I just Googled it and uh, was just kind of blown away and I just started asking you know myself why haven't I seen these birds before what are they doing here because they look like something that should be in a zoo because we see pretty things in a zoo right the only the only birds I ever saw around me growing up in South Carolina were just little brown birds um, but we have I, you know on eBird we were talking about that before I think over 400 different bird species have been seen in South Carolina so think about that um, 400 different species, uh, pretty amazing. So a lot of these birds are coming up from South America, Central America, Mexico, and they look like the painted bunting that Isaiah loves so much. They look like the Baltimore Oriole and, and so, so many other colors. So uh, yeah, a pretty bird changed my life. Um, and uh, I've been working for South Carolina Wildlife Federation now for, for three years almost. Um, here, let me go to the next page. Um, so let's talk about how how to attract some of those birds um, to your yard. And, um, you know, we'll talk about the common ones first. And we have, uh, Justin was talking about the beautiful male northern cardinal before. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put Isaiah's great picture of a female up. I, I ran out of room here, but uh, she's got her crest up. Looks like a Tina Turner version of a cardinal. Um, we have a beautiful red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, if you put out some suet, and suet is just kind of a, a fatty. Um, some of them have nuts and other goodies in them. Um, package that you can put right here. Uh, you just pop a couple of those, and they they attract they attract things like nuthatches, um, you know, woodpeckers, and some other birds. Um, and then you put the seeds right here and you get things like like cardinals, uh, the tufted titmouse, or I'm sorry, this is a Carolina chickadee. Sorry, I can't see the, the first half of the bird, <laughs> but it's a Carolina chickadee, I believe. And then uh, the Carolina wren over here, which is our state bird. Um, but I also included this caterpillar, a beautiful spice bush uh, swallowtail uh, a caterpillar that we found not too long ago, but that's bird food as well. And you think about birds um, when they are having their babies, uh, they feed their, uh, their young ones uh, thousands of caterpillars. So, you know, you want to have native plants around your house as well, like your native oak trees, your native hickories, your maples, uh, perennials like goldenrod and asters, all of those pump or create a ton of probably literally, right? Um, caterpillars, and that is also bird food uh, during their most important time, um, their, their breeding uh, season. Um, but including water um, and a place to raise young, you know, I know Isaiah is putting up a ton of boxes, I think, on your property, um, you know, cover in the form of, you know, trees, brush piles, whatever that might be, you know, all these will bring more birds to your yard. So y'all, y'all chime in with any other tips that y'all might have for these folks that are watching. Well, me personally, you know, kind of what Jay was just saying, with my backyard, a lot of our housing that we do for the birds are natural housing. So with like a cardinal, they love bushes, they love brushwood, they love a lot of different things like that. So me personally, when I do my yard maintenance, I have one area on my property that I actually will put you know, a lot of branches, a lot of little extra bushel, a lot of different things to create the natural habitat for them. Uh, me personally, another thing that I do because of all the trees that I have on my property, we have a lot of leaves, you know, a lot of leaves. So what I actually do is I push, of course, you want to keep the front of the yard clean, <laughs> but I push all of my leaves back and I have a little area in my backyard too where I'm placing up a lot of brushwood a lot of, uh, like I said, leaves, a lot of things like that. And then just, just how Jay was saying about this sewer feeder, they work amazingly. Uh, you know, like I was telling you about my fiance, Jasmine, she, she's put out multiple, which I think it was like two of them recently she put out and it lasted no time. 
<laughs> so when it comes to food, uh, area for habitat, and me personally, I, I do have a little niche because I do have a creek that it actually runs through my backyard too. Because that's another thing, uh, you know, other than food, they need hydration and they need a place to bath. So they will love those three things. So me personally, that's how I you know, have seen uh, a lot of more birds on my property. What about you, Justin? Thanks for sharing, Isaiah. So the biggest thing, we have bird, several bird feeders at our home. Um, the biggest thing I could say is get a squirrel baffle. Um, we, me and the squirrels, we had a, a time this summer, uh, this past summer, you know, they'd be back there swinging back and forth, eating the bird food, and then they go to the next one. Um, and it's the squirrel baffle, it's a little cone that goes on the, on the pole, so the squirrel can't run up and, and hop on your feeder. Um, as if you look at the one in the middle of the screen, I like it because it, it serves as a catch. The ones that you get from maybe Walmart, uh, the, the smaller birds, if you don't put a, a strainer on it, they'll flick a lot of the food out and it'll fall to the ground. So if you want ground feeding birds, like let's say morning doves, that's okay. I, I like for some of that food to spill to the ground because you will get rabbits um, that come back down there, the squirrels will be less interested in climbing up that pole and they'll have a little bit to eat too. So you get a, a nice diversity there. Um, another thing that I would add is uh, occasionally I'll set up a video stand. I try to do it about 10 or 15 feet away to discourage birds from landing on it. And what you can do is you can set it up maybe just before uh, sunrise and let it record for an hour. And you'll have a really cool video of different birds that'll, that'll visit your feeder. And the last thing is if you're a parent and you wanna do something like maybe make your world or your backyard a certified wildlife habitat, there are several organizations that you can do it through, but um, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, they, they have a certification where you can go on and you'll be able to print out a, uh, a certificate. So if your kids work really hard on putting those birdhouses up, those bird feeders and making uh, the bird bath, supplying everything that bird will need for, to make it a habitat, um, they can get a really cool certification that you can hang up in the house and it's kind of a, a feather in their hat for all their work, hard work that they're, they've done. Awesome, man, great tips. What about you, Jen? Uh, well, I will echo what everyone said and do a squirrel-proof bird feeding. Um, I've been preaching that for years since I first started at the, the bird seed stores when I was uh, in high school. And then also the native plants. I, I put in a new area of native plants almost every spring or every fall, um, trying to reduce the amount of lawn cover you have because turf grass is usually monoculture. It takes a lot of resources to maintain. So reducing your lawn and putting in more natives is awesome. Um, and then that one other thing that I will mention is leaving uh, dead snags or dead trees. As long as they're not a falling hazard on your house, they are really great natural bird feeders because they're full of insects. And then also they're great uh, sources of cavities. So two neighbors down, um, they had this beautiful uh, pecan tree that died, but they left a big part of the snag in the backyard and there was a cavity in it and a screech owl family moved in. So it was really awesome to see that. Unfortunately, that snag um, rotted out. And so I uh, jumped on that opportunity. I put up a screech owl house. And right now the pair moved down to my yard and I've got them in my house right now sitting on eggs and I'm so excited. So providing housing, food, water, native plants, and then the dead snags and brush piles is kind of in the similar category. Uh, those are all really good things. Yeah, no, that's awesome. The first screech owl I saw was at my in-laws house in, in Pennsylvania, and it was also in a, in a snag, a dead tree still standing. So great, great tip. Um, yeah, that was awesome, y'all. Appreciate it. All right. All right. So, you know, we talked about some of the, the common birds, you know, that are here and how to attract them. Um, but these are some of the ones that, you know, to us, they're probably common because we go out searching for them all the time every single year. Um, but you know, these are, these are five birds that I had no idea existed. Um, when I was, I, I was born and raised in South Carolina and spent a ton of time playing sports, hunting, fishing outside. And I had no idea these existed and that shouldn't be the case. Um, so, you know, things like the black and white warbler, some of them winter around here, but a lot of them go down to the tropics to, to winter. Um, the indigo bunting, another example of that, but that's that's the bird, the, the second bird that I saw that just kind of blew me away whenever I first got into this. Uh, beautiful birds like the American avocet, um, the prothonotary warbler, uh, that's a cavity nesting warbler here on the eastern side of the United States. Um, that bird comes all the way uh, up from, a lot of them, uh, from Columbia, South America to South Carolina, 
Columbia, South Carolina, especially to, to breed. Um, Y'all have a ton of them down in, at Bidler Forest. Um, and then the Rosette Spoonbill, the first one I saw was on my way over to, to Savannah um, and it was flying over the bridge and I thought it was a flamingo, <laughs> uh, of course. Um, but it's not, it's a Rosette Spoonbill and they're, and they're here along the coast. Um, every now and then we'll get reports of people seeing them in, in the, the Piedmont as well. But, um, you know, they, they live down there at the coast uh, pretty, pretty commonly. So um, just, just gorgeous birds. And again, we are just scratching the surface on this. Um, there are over 400 that, that have been seen in South Carolina. So go out um, and, and explore and, and see these birds. Um, and we'll, anything that y'all want to kind of add about, about this, this page right here, any, any birds that are just kind of, um, stunners for y'all that you want to talk about? Well, me personally, uh, I think, you know, this joke, but <laughs> my first time seeing a spoonbill, I was with you. <laughs> so oh, yeah. that was a, a big eye opener for me because kind of just play off of what you just said. I almost said it myself. Is that a flamingo? <laughs> right. <laughs> Truth be told, they look just like them. Also, the indigo bunting. You know that we actually seen that uh, when we went to I think it was a Lake Conesty yep. uh, Preserve. We went to Lake Conesty Preserve and actually saw indigo indigo bunting. So, you know, those are the birds. Like these birds right here, as we speak, are the ones that will really, I personally feel, will kind of open your eyes to new experiences when this is an animal that you usually won't see on a daily basis, you know, just because they're so unique. And I feel like these are the birds that kind of create that beginning steps for a, a, a birder to start birding, you know, because once they see some of these unique birds, it's not like the birds that you, you know, were, were raised, you know, seeing, because me personally, I'm from the upstate. So we don't see too many spoonbills in the city, <laughs> you know, you're going to see those more on the coast line you know, closer to like the water. So when I did see an animal like that spoonbill, including that indigo bunch and that right there are some of the eye openers that actually hit me to wanting to get out and bird more. Yeah, just, I mean, they're, they're beautiful, right? And you, and you wanna see more. Um, anything that y'all wanna add? I was gonna say that uh, I used to live on the coast in Myrtle Beach. We had a uh, Huntington Beach State Park where you get to see a lot of birds, a lot of different migratory birds. Now we're getting the uh, white pelicans coming in. But one of my favorite places to actually go, and if your local dump will allow it, is check out the dump, especially in January when the gulls get here. Um, that's where you'll see more bald eagles, vultures, and gulls than you can ever imagine. That's one of my favorite places to go. We had the Highway 90 dump, and I would go out there every other week, and it was just amazing the volume of birds that you get to see out there that's one that i don't have on the list on the next page a dump <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool you're not the first person i said you know to that recommended going to one what about you jen uh yeah i will second the dumps they are actually very good birding um <laughs> but i will say that the uh, indigo bunting if i had to pick a favorite songbird or passerine it's probably the indigo bunting they're just so striking yeah and then another species that i just never get tired of just watching for long periods of time is either species of kite the mississippi kite or the swallowtail kite watching them forage and they just barely ever flap their wings they do all these aerial acrobatics it's just like I think it's one of the coolest things you can witness is, you know, big foraging flock of kites. So. Yeah. And when you talk about all these different species, I know Justin is a big kite, kite fan too. Um, you know, think about your Audubon's website. You know, y'all have a great website where you can uh, just kind of type in a bird um, and, and find, find information on it. Um, allaboutbirds.org is a great place to look up any of the birds that we've talked about today. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there for y'all to um, find these birds, learn about them, um, and even practice their sounds. You know, Justin was talking about the sounds earlier. If you want to see more birds, learn their sounds because you're going to hear more birds than you than you see typically. But when you hear them, you can go find them, and that's and that's a fun game to play. Um, and then. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about this the entire time. Um, you know, bird, birds get you to explore the entire planet. They're everywhere, by the way, on all seven continents. Um, so you can go anywhere on, in the world and, and find birds. 
Um, but you know, it'll it'll connect you to the to the to the arachnids, to the to the insects. It'll it'll you know before birding, I had no idea that this crown slug uh, caterpillar even existed. I had no idea that the green link link spider existed. Um, this beautiful red bellied snake here. Um, I know it exists now because of birds. Um, and you know, I grew up with on Lake Murray, and and we had double crested cormorants. But until I started, you know, kind of getting into phot photography just a little bit, but more of just knowing photographers, I had no idea that they had these jewel of of eyes, these gorgeous, gorgeous eyes. Um, and then I guess my last thought on this on this page is is just you know all of what you're seeing right now is bird food. You know, birds eat birds. Um, watch a watch a um, bluebird uh, feed feed the babies. Um, tons of spiders, tons of caterpillars, um, and bluebirds will even eat snakes. Um, I've seen them eat lizards. Um, you know, the small ones, obviously. But uh, you know, we need all all of this, not just the birds. Uh, we need we need everything um, because everything supports everything else, <laughs> I guess. Um, but any anyhow, any any thoughts on on this page here? Uh, if I had to say anything about this page, you know, I would kind of play off of what Jennifer said when uh, a lot of native, a lot of native plants, a lot of native, you know, just things outdoors to bring uh, these snakes, you know, the arachnids, the, the caterpillars, you know, just small things like that. If you can find ways on your own household and your own property to get some native plants, native trees, just anything native that is going to attract these animals. It's, it's, it's a funny way the world works when you attract you know, some caterpillars and how many birds kind of swoop down. <laughs> and Isaiah knows all this stuff now because of birds. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I do. That is very true. Cause it's, oh, it, and that has really started to, you know, open my eyes because, you know, my fiance Jasmine, she's an avid gardener. So she loves being in the outdoors. So now we're starting to get into doing like native wildflowers, just anything like a lot of native small plants that will bring, you know, a lot of big food. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, so, you know, Isaiah's up in the, the upper state. He loves uh, Lake Conesee. That's where he saw his first indigo bunting. Um, you know, Jen, you, you work, do you work at Bidler Forest? Kind of. I'm all over the place. So we have an office in downtown Charleston. I work for Palm on Jens Island. I'm at Bidler, you know, multiple times a month. I'm going to Silver Bluff next week. So I'm all okay. over and, and these are and these are all fantastic places to visit. So y'all, the folks in in the lower part of the state, Call Call Interpretive Center um, is is fantastic. Uh, Bidler Forest is is obviously a, a fan, great place to go. Congaree National Park, um, you know, right outside of Columbia. Uh, uh, let's see, Saluda Shoals Park. Y'all go see Justin over there and and bird there. Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve is another one in the Midlands. Uh, Bear Island is another place down by the coast. That's where. We saw our uh, rosette spoonbills with, with with Isaiah and the mountains of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Boy, they can be really exciting to uh, to bird. Um, any any other places that y'all might recommend to folks watching this? Well, I know one one place that I can actually say it's Santee State Park. I love Santee. Uh, it's a great area. It has a lot of water around that area, so you you will get a very different amount. And uh, also. Um, uh, Sassafras, Sassafras Mountain, which is kind of in between South Carolina and North Carolina. It's actually where they meet. <laughs> but Sassafras Mountain, uh, that is a great area because of how high it is. A lot of birds like being up in that high range because they feel like they're getting away from a lot of predators. So I feel like that is an another real good one to add to it. Okay. Um, what about you, Jennifer? Where, where, what's your favorite place to bird in here in South Carolina? Oh, favorite place. That's that's tough to pick. Um, all the places you guys mentioned, Bear Island, Donald, those are awesome. But I do have little kids and they sometimes don't handle long field days out to Bear Island. And so one of my places to go, easy birding that's accessible and it doesn't take long and you see a lot is uh, Pitt Street Bridge in Mount Pleasant. It's like the causeway that used to be a, a trolley. And uh, there's a nice path out there and it goes right into the marsh. And so you get to see all the marsh birds come right up. There's oyster catchers, there's eagles flying over, all the wading birds. And so it's really accessible and easy to get to and uh, easy parking. So it's a really good stop to bring the birds really close to you and see a whole lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, great resource right there. What about you, Justin? Very cool. So, uh... Earlier, I was mentioning the dump. That's my favorite place to go watch those all those beautiful gulls that sometimes make their way from the over from the west coast. 
Um, but here, the Lake Murray Dam mm. um, and Drew Island State Park, those are two uh, easily accessible areas that you can see some of the, the water birds out there. And then Drew Island like, occasionally get some really nice warblers like the black and white warbler that you showed earlier. Um, those are probably two of my favorite places to go other than here at the park. Right. Well, and, you know, just hearing y'all talk, I, I, I always lo love going to the river, the river walk right here in, in Columbia. Justin and I are Midlands guys. Um, Isaiah's in the upper state, and then we've got Jen down, down at the coast. But uh, yeah, the river walk, and that's where, you know, it goes now under the bridge that connects the botanical garden to the actual zoo at Riverbank Zoo. Um, and then it goes all the way down to a place called Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve. So uh, you get to walk along the Saluda and then just a hair of the broad, I guess, and then the Congaree. So really great place to go. Um, so just get out and explore. Any, uh, any, any last thoughts for, for any of you, you from any of y'all uh, for any, any folks that are watching this? Yeah, I, actually, I would say one more place because listening to Justin and listening to Jennifer kind of, you know, when they said that the, 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 like how easy locations are certain ways and certain walks, I personally feel like the easiest place to go is your backyard. Uh, just stepping outside, just taking a look up. Uh, if you like, like Jay was saying earlier, you can be at the grocery store, you can be at church. I feel like just look up. You know, just take a two seconds just to look up if you hear it, just look in that direction, uh, because I feel like those locations in themselves are going to be very accessible for anyone that's living a day to day life. You know, you can just walk outside, you know, do your little morning stretch and just look around, you know, because that is a great place to bird uh, because it's, it's so easy. It's accessible. It's, it's, you don't have to crank the car. You don't have to go anywhere. You know, you don't have to bring gear. <laughs> you know, you can just step in your backyard and just take a look around. And I personally feel like that will be the most easiest uh, place for it. You know, especially like uh, Jennifer was saying, like families, uh, if you if you have a big family, don't want to pack everyone in a car, uh, just just take a look in your backyard. You know, just walk around, you know, walk, walk down the neighborhood street, you know, and just look around because, uh, uh, you know, you might find different birds in different locations, but if you just want to get out and bird, those are the easiest locations. I personally feel like they are. Uh, yeah, I would I, say I if you're, you oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, if you're um, just starting out and don't know where to begin, finding someone else who's a birder and just tagging along is one great way to learn. But if you don't have uh, someone close to you that you can just tag along with, um, the Merlin Bird ID app is really, really good for beginners because it just walks you through these steps of where are you? What color is the bird about? How big was it? And it gives you a list of pictures to choose from of the birds that you likely saw. So I feel like that's one of the best ways to really start learning ID, like in your neighborhood and in your backyard and in your local parks. So highly recommend if you're just starting out. Anything Very else? Cool. And I was just gonna say birding is infinite. Um, whether you're traveling to, let's say you go to Louisiana and you see these uh, whistling ducks standing in trees, never seen that before, or um, you're doing things locally, uh, just getting out and exploring and you can do competitions with it, with your family, or you can just sit, take simple, nice photos. Uh, birding is really infinite. The things that you can do with it, um, try many different styles, you know, go out and do a behavior study. What, what is this mockingbird doing for 20 minutes? Or um, are you building your life list? You know, getting how many species, however many species you can in that two miles. Um, and if you go out in the morning and you go out that afternoon, the birds that you might see are different. So it doesn't matter what time of day, it doesn't matter what you're doing or where you're going, you will always have a good time birding. Man, I, I feel like I shouldn't say anything because it's just gonna mess up the, everything that y'all have said because you've said it so perfectly. Um, but, but I guess I, 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 I should share something, but um, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that it's a gift for every person on the planet. Um, and it, it can, it can be free. Uh, you can spend a lot of money on, on certain binoculars and scopes and all that kind of stuff and cameras, 
Um, but you, you know, technically it's, it's, it's free, um, but it's for everybody. Um, so if you're not into it, give it a try. If you are into it, take some other people out and try to get them connected. Um, our world needs it. Um, you know, look at, look around. Um, there's a lot of pollution. Um, there's a lot of degradation, um, and exploitation of natural resources. So the, the more people that fall in love with these, these birds and, and whatever else, uh, or whatever, I guess, other wildlife, you know, that they may fall in love with, the, the more caretakers we're going to have. So just, just spread the word and get out there. Um, well, and I appreciate y'all um, joining us, um, you know, whoever's watching, and I appreciate y'all three joining us as well. And uh, I, I thought this was fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and start, stop recording. <laughs>